I was talking to some uh, people this morning about how to get um, auto shop back in the schools when the schools can't afford it. And I suggest we get a retired mechanic to do it in his garage. And then we have to worry about, well, is there going to be liability or something? And then I start visualizing some important safety. The advice problems. and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live Sorry. and her guests are meant Congrats. solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Oh, I forgot that. This will happen too. Then we'll be back. I like to dance. Good morning and welcome to this very special edition of Autism Live. Uh, you know, we have to go with this new format. We have to go live and we always have the choice to mute. And uh, we have with us Dr. Temple Grandin and, and she was saying, "Why well, no, let's just stay. But then I apologize for the opening segments and the disclaimer. Uh, and we interrupted you in mid-sentence too, Dr. Grandin. But thrilled to have you here this morning. The topic this morning that we're going to be focusing on is finding and feeding our children's passions. And this is something that you guys write in questions for Dr. Grandin all the time. It's an area of her particular expertise. We're thrilled to have her here with us. Before we jump into that, um, I've been talking with all of you on a regular basis here and with Dr. Grandin the other day about our dear beloved Joanne Lara, who is uh, gravely, gravely ill and um, you know, we, we had the opportunity the other day, there were some wonderful people who said some really shout out, shout outs to her. Um, and I asked Temple if there was anything that she would like to say to Joanne, uh, because she's had the opportunity to work with Joanne on a couple of different things. Um, and you kicked off the, you know, her passion project when she started Autism Works Now, she asked Temple to come and the kickoff event was called Temple Grandin and Friends and, and Temple came and gave such an incredible speech at the Nokia Theater. Um, and there were so many amazing dignitaries there and it was just like the perfect beginning. And we all had t-shirts that said, I'm friends with uh, Dr. Temple Grandin. It was such a big, big event that started this movement towards getting employment for individuals with autism. But Temple, um, is there anything that you would like to say? Well, I'd just like to say that she was somebody that got things done. I really liked the glorious pie truck because I think a lot of things that are going to work are going to be th more local things done in the neighborhood. I'm going to be doing a talk to judges, you know, and a lot of kids get in trouble. And um, people ask me all the time, how did I get interested in the cattle industry? I was exposed to it when I was 15, when I went to my aunt's ranch. We're supposed to be working on developing kids' passions. I think in a lot of cases, kids are not getting exposed to enough stuff to figure out their passions because the schools have taken out auto shop and welding and art and cooking and sewing and drafting and all of these uh, kinds of classes. So we've got to start doing things in the neighborhood, like maybe have yeah. a retired mechanic set up a shop. And we got to talking about how they deal with liability. And I said, yes, I've worked in industrial safety. There's certain safety things I've got to have, like a special container for greasy rags so you don't have fires. I want gloves on the kids so they don't get into solvents. They don't have to have them on fixing the car, but if they mess them with solvents, they've got to have gloves on. Yeah, there's yeah. a few safety things. I want to do those, but we need to figure out um, how to just do things in the neighborhood and something like the glorious pie truck. That's an example of something that was done in the neighborhood, very <laughs> creative, and it wasn't that expensive to start and it can slowly grow. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Joanne was all, uh, you know, in, devoted her life to making sure that um, individuals with autism, first, she started with the autism movement therapy and, you know, was doing that not as just a dance class, but a dance class to help them to link their body to their brains. And um, so Joanne has been a passionate fighter, um, 
making sure that the kinds of things that you talk about Temple came to pass. And um, I think we all wanna just say a big shout out to Joanne, how much we love her. And uh, I can't imagine a world without her, but I, I, that is imminent. And um, I know, you know, we had talked about this and you just wanted an opportunity to just, you know, give that little shout out to her because she, you're right. She was somebody who got things done. She got and she, things done. Another thing she, she's done in her career is writing about it. Mm -hmm. Write about how to do it. Because when I've, I've done a lot of things in my career. I've been in the meat industry now for 47 years. And I would design a project and then I wrote about it. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where I get the editor's card because I realized if I wrote for that magazine, that would really help my career. Then I have to figure out why is this project newsworthy? Now, I couldn't write about every single corral I designed because a lot of them were just more of the same thing. But something where I had something original, like my entrance design on that dip fat, I wrote about it. You see, and there's a lot of people doing some really clever, good, innovative neighborhood things but they're not writing them up. I've seen some very innovative stuff done in schools. They're not getting the stuff written up on how to do it. And I yes. just wrote simple how to do articles on how to design cattle handling facilities. But you're right, Joanne did write about it and we're so thrilled that there is a book that details the autism movement um, therapy method. And there is also a wonderful book that she co-wrote with Susan Osborne that is that's really the Autism Works Now method where it's uh, teaching pre-employment skills to 14 to 17 year olds. Yes. Both, both of them are available on Amazon and we encourage people um, to look at those because Joanne's work lives on in those books and in so many other ways. And thank you for saying that Temple because I think we all forget sometimes that it's important that not only to do something, but to write about it so that others can learn from the things. No, that this done. is the thing. So others yeah. could do it. I went to a little talk that a really innovative teacher did on teaching history by having uh, do, all the kids doing all kinds of making Egyptian things when they studied the Egyptian history. And I said, you need to make a YouTube video of what you just told us at this little, um, you know, book, uh, book signing thing that I went to. Just put, do the same thing, do it on a YouTube video. I don't think she ever did. It, and she gave the greatest talk. I wish it had been recorded, but then somebody needs to professionally edit the slides in there and do it nicely yeah, so that other people could do it. Yeah, and I, you know, I think a lot of times uh, we get caught up and there's the hours in the day, but it's important to prioritize. And this week has really taught me that because I, you know, just... Um, I love Joanne so much, and I know that she had a lot more work that she intended to do. But, you know, for all of us, there's a time when the work needs to end. And um, to be that what's left is what the impression you made on people, but what you put in writing is, is there forever. Well, it, 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 um, it tells people how to do stuff. A lot of people just don't know where to start. And uh, what am I doing this summer? Because we're still pretty well locked down. I have to like go to a special web page for me allowed to go on campus. I'm writing a, a new book on visual thinking and why visual oh. thinking is important. Um, and the movie showed how I think visually. And I'm worried that our visual thinkers are getting discriminated against because we absolutely can't do algebra. You don't need algebra for skilled trade. You need old fashioned sixth grade arithmetic the way they used to teach it. That you do need. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I wanna segue into, because this is the topic that, you know, goes hand in hand with this. This is the topic for today um, that, that you and I had talked about that we, you know, that you felt passionate about and that so many people have written questions in about how do I find my child's passion and how do I feed their passion? All right, the so, first thing is, how do you find it? I think yeah. a lot of kids today are not getting exposed to enough different things because the schools have taken out so many activities yeah. that they're not gonna find the passion. When I was in, in high school, uh, cattle wasn't anything I even thought about. I got <laughs> exposed to it. Horses again, I got exposed to them. What if I'd not been exposed to them? And I'm seeing too many kids today where the only thing they're exposed to is video games and they're getting completely addicted and they're not going anywhere. Uh, if they were becoming great game designers, I wouldn't be criticizing, but that's not what's happening. But uh, taking the hands-on classes out of the schools, on uh, music, theater, all these kinds of things, worst thing they ever did. 
I think we've got to start getting these things going in the neighborhood. So in this COVID time and during this summer, for these families that are listening to this and they're like, okay, I'm Rev. I've got the time. I've got a little bit of time this summer. I want to find my child's passion, but I can't take them places. Like, All let's because right. I know you're a problem solver. So let's come up with some things that they can do to, to expose their kids to things to see what they're passionate All about. All right. First of all, gardening is taking off right now. That's something you could do. People are remodeling their houses. So oh, Home Depot is probably having a great time right now selling stuff for that. Uh, building things, camping in your backyard. And then, of course, I've got my book, uh, Calling All Minds. It's yes. also about famous inventors. And there's things that we can do. Build things, art, we can do that. Take a programming class. There's all kinds of free classes online on Khan Academy, on um, Wolfram Mathematica, a real great mathematics site. And if you want to turn on the math kids, look up Protein Symmetry on Google Images. Protein Symmetry. I just looked it up again the other day. You it's got like me these turned on to that. windows are inside your body. It's like, <laughs> I just, but let's just I you know, get, get uh, creative. I was reading just in our local paper about how the neighbors were doing things together. They were keeping social distancing, but they were doing things together. I've seen yeah, I've, I've met more of my neighbors since this happened than I had in the year before I lived here because people are connecting with each other across the fence. That's exactly uh, so, what's happening here in my neighborhood. I'm meeting people that I've never met before. I love it. And they're out walking their dogs or they're playing yeah. catch out in the grass. Yeah. Um, let, Let me ask to... you something, Temple. Have you ever done any of the virtual, like put, when you put on the virtual glasses and you get to go someplace like to the Grand yes, Canyon? And what do you think about that for the autistic mind? Do you feel like that that's a beneficial thing or do you have concerns about that? Well, I that? think in moderation, it'd be okay, but it's not the same as doing it. They had a, no. dem a demonstration of a, a Facebook had a demonstration of super virtual reality. They had the Denver airport. And I went and I tried it. And mm -hmm. uh, now this was probably four years ago. Uh, I thought the images were blurry. Oh. But the thing is, when I turned my head, the image, you know, that was realistic. I could do this. Yeah. I also got kind of disoriented and I had to hold on to the wall because yeah. I was afraid I was going to fall. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's things we can do with virtual reality, but it's not going to replace doing real things. But let's, there's let's, a lot let's of introduce tools to kids. Yes. Let's learn how to use tools safely, or we learn how to use watercolors, or you know some different art things. But I'm finding we got a lot of kids today. They haven't even made a paper snowflake. That's one of my beginner projects in my book. They oh, haven't it. even done something that simple. I love that. Hold the book up again and tell us where we can get it. Well, and, and Amazon's got it and also comes in the paperback version that's a bright yellow. It's the same book except it's bright yellow. It also has patents in it and talks about famous inventors. Uh -huh. So you learn about how people patent things. It has projects ranging from simple stuff like the paper snowflake, the little airplanes and kites and, my, and the optical illusion room is in there. That's one yeah. of the difficult projects that's in there um but just, let's get kids building things how about learning yeah. cooking oh my let's gosh do something yeah, like cooking. that every we need cooking happening this summer that's for sure well let's do that let's learn yeah. all the life skills on um that's the kind of stuff that we need to be doing there's a lot of there's, stuff you can do i don't know if you've seen because you know every year we put out a toy guide um to recommend things and there's a company, and of course, I can't think what their name is right now. I'm going to Google it and find it. But they put out steam kits that they're basically erector sets that are for us to build a specific thing each month. And it comes in the mail and the kids get it. And it's got, they've got these beautiful guides, but it has everything they need to build a Ferris wheel or build, um, they're, they're really cool kits. I don't well, know if that's cool, but then made. again, I want them building something from scratch too. There, we well, but, all yes. kinds of stuff from scratch and, you know, just uh, scraps of wood, nails. When I was in second grade, I was cutting coat hangers with a, with a pair of pliers. I was not allowed to use a saw in second grade, but I was using screwdriver, hammer and pliers, scissors. And what were you building? Grade. Well, were you one building of the things the I was doing hanger? coat hangers 
<laughs> is um, I wanted to make a, and it's in the Calling All Minds book, a parachute that when I threw my little parachute up in the air that was made with a scarf, it wouldn't mm -hmm. open. So I made these spreader bars like this out of bent coat hanger with bent ends. I could barely cut it and I had to make a dent and then do this. And I made a spreader bar just right. And you know what's interesting? I have found patents of spreader bar things for real parachutes. But I was doing this when I was like in second grade. Second grade. grade to template. make a, mm -hmm. and that projects in, uh, in the book. And I just do it by, did it by myself. Nobody helped me. This was something I just figured out on my own. And I'd make a different design. Then I'd chuck it up in the air. And when we did the book, we recreated that. And some of the, my little projects weren't as easy to recreate as I thought they were going to be. You now, really? kids need to learn, learn to tinker. But let's just start uh, doing things. Um, but, you know, part of the other thing, you know, because we said finding the passion, but then feeding it. And, and one of the things that I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about is that your mother, when you were in second grade and deciding to cut coat hangers, didn't say to you, let's oh, not let do, do that. Now, now saw wasn't allowed and knives were not allowed. There was right. no rules. I could use the pliers. But you were cutting the wire. Hammer, the screwdriver and, the, and na nails. Screws yeah. and, and, uh, I got to tell you that when my son was three, he sat underneath, I don't know how, well, first he started taking apart flashlights and he, anytime there was a flashlight or a remote control anywhere, he would take it apart. And, it, and I would take it away from him because we needed the flashlights and we needed the remote controls. Then he sat, he got a screwdriver and he sat underneath the dining room table and was taking it apart. And I, because I didn't know you then, was like, no, and hid the screwdriver. Now no, I wish I- No, what we would do now, let's get some screws from the hardware store, screwdriver, let's get him a Phillips too. So he learns there was a Phillips screwdriver and a regular screwdriver and- uh, uh, by the time I got to third grade, I had a little egg beater drill like this yes. and, uh, and, and some tools and he can start to screw things together, do stuff with bolts. Yeah. Well, you know, now he's, he's 17. He's not going to try to eat them or something. I, right. Now my I, son is 17 and he's on his competitive robotics team and he's got cool. an outlet for that. And he, and he went to his local maker site for a couple of years and learned how to do CNC and we fed Good. the passion that way. Good. But when he was little, I didn't realize that I that I needed to be, he wanted to take apart the vacuum cleaner. No, let's get him some old vacuum cleaners that are his that he can take apart. In other right. words, and they have to be unplugged. There's a very strict rule about that. Yeah. Because I was taught, you know, you never hit anybody with a hammer. I was taught how to use tools safely. The only thing you hit with a hammer is a board or a nail. Yeah. You know, that, that's, um, uh, that's the rules. But we have kids growing up today that don't use tools. So how are they going to know they like tools if they never use them? Yeah. Uh, I think Legos are great, but I think when you're 16, you ought to be used, building with some other things too. You could combine Legos into other things that you make. How do you think you start that? Like, let's say that you've got a five-year-old kid, because I think part of the problem is Temple that we, like I wasn't uh, really raised to know how to use tools and neither was my husband. So if we don't really know how to use the tools, what do you think is a safe way to start with our right, little thing one? called a play school workbench? Yeah, start okay. with that at two. Oh, okay. have like giant plastic wrenches that can do bolts with heads that big. Play school, Wonderful. it's totally safe. And, uh, and you get those toys. So that okay. introduces the, the idea of tools. Now, another thing, let's say you have a kid that's a math kid and he's in fourth grade and he's doing baby math and he's bored and nobody thought to introduce programming. Yeah. You've got scratch programming for kids, it's free. You yes. can go, uh, you wanna find out how Minecraft works? Then learn to program in JavaScript. You can buy a book really inexpensively <laughs> on Amazon. I have looked them up. Well, These that leads me into a question. So that, I, that I, back, you gotta expose them. You gotta yes. expose them. Well, that leads me to a question that I wanted to ask because a dear friend of ours wrote it in from Autism Will Not Define My Son. She says, hi, Temple. My son is 10, nonverbal, but almost there. He is excelling at, uh, at school in math and he seems to really like it. She says, math was my worst subject in school, so I'm not sure where or how to guide him, especially as he grows older. What well, things- well, can, harder what, math. There she goes. Don't but she give says, them this crazy verbal math they have now. Get the old fashioned math books that are just all numbers, not the okay. standard verbal stuff they have now. Old fashioned math books, dig them out of the attic somewhere. He'll okay. probably eat them right up. 
I don't understand. She's... Algebra book? I use that for doorstop. But <laughs> you give it to some other kid. Yeah. It can open okay. a gigantic door. But okay. you don't know until you expose. Okay. That's so, the so, because she says, what can I do to help increase his math skills and keep him excited about it? But mom's admitting that, you know, like, this is me too. I got to be honest. She doesn't have to know anything about math. Take him to the Wolfram Mathematica site. Tell me, say Wolfram. that slower. Wolf. wolf, wolf, like the animal, the, yeah. the animal called a wolf. Ram, like a male sheep. Wolfram okay. Mathematica. It's a great website. I was just on it just the other day. I looked it up again. Okay. Wolfram look up, look Mathematica. Up fractals. Use fractals. Google Images when you look this stuff up. Man, okay. you'll find the cool math stuff. You just have to expose them to it. Okay. You don't have to understand it. You give the kid an algebra book. You don't have to understand it. Just give it to them. <laughs> And, you and just see, have to find and it he, and give it to him. And he might use it as a doorstop too, then, but if he then doesn't. It's not for him. Then right, it's not right, right, him. right. But you don't know until you expose. Because when I look back at a lot of the big innovators that really, really like you take like Ellen Musk here, he grew up in a in a in a in a family that had a workshop and tons of books. Thomas Edison was described as a hyperactive adult high school dropout, but his mom homeschooled him in a library full of books. There's been engineers that self-train themselves with their grandfather's textbooks, but they were there in the bookshelf. So the kid could pull them out and look at them. See, again, it's amazing? exposure. So you yeah. don't know until you expose. And what worries me today is kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff. It, well, it's true, especially now, because while we're social distancing, I mean, I used to take my son to museums on a regular basis. That's why I was asking about the virtual. Well, let's, do, let's, let's go. The, the well, museums all have websites now. Exactly. Let's, uh, let's go explore some of this stuff on websites and let's do it maybe with somebody else while we're going to go look at the Louvre or look at whatever. Yes. A lot of people are asking if we're actually live now because sometimes we play your recorded um, interviews, but I just want to point out to everybody that this is Tuesday, June, what's the date? The 9th. And so we are live Tuesday, June 9th. Um, people are writing in how much they love you. Um, they're saying that they hate video games, that you're amazing. They can't wait for your new- Well, let me tell you a little something about books. Mr. Musk right here. Yeah. Well, well, you know all about, oh man, I geeked out on, I geeked out <laughs> on the SpaceX. I was glued to an iPad. I was over at Mark's house. So I was glued oh. to this iPad and they scrubbed the first launch because of the weather. The next launch, I'm glued. And I watched it live for full 20 minutes till it was safely in orbit. Right. And you know why those spacesuits were so cool? Because they were made by a costume designer. Isn't that wonderful? I wanted to dress them up really, really cool. <laughs> uh, total. And I, I geeked out on three hours of live docking. Three <laughs> hours of live docking. I geeked out on that. Totally geeked out. I, lo I and, love that. But, but okay, did let's you go back to go this guy. Yes. Okay. How did he avoid the video game addiction? He's 48. So what okay. I actually did is I figured out that he would be the video, he loved video games. But okay. at the age of 48, he would have been looking at Mario Brothers. I went back and I played the video games, late 80s, early 90s, that would have been the right age. For, and they were the kind of games were a lot less addictive because what he wanted to do was to open a video game store and sell them. And the uh, shopping center wouldn't let him sign a lease because he was too young. Oh my goodness. He wants I didn't so know many that. Games. But they they <clears throat> also those old games broke all the time. So you get the blue screen with all the color yes. on it. Yes. Well, you see, I call that a computer showing the guts. And then you start to get interested in that code. They don't see that today. He's just old enough. He's just old enough to have avoided. The video game addiction and i went through i play, i probably played six or seven of the, i didn't actually play them but i looked at the vid, youtube videos of you know the popular games of that he yeah. would have been playing yeah and, and he would have been like between 10 and 17. well it's interesting um you know because i those were the video games that i was exposed to too in the beginning i didn't get them i was like what is the what is the the thing but when i keyed into the fact that it was there was a level of problem solving in them well, like you had to some figure good out how to learn with video games, but the problem is these kids are getting so sucked in. Anything, any benefit, there are some benefits with video games, 
what any benefit you would have, you'd get in an hour a day. Yeah. And yes, in, you're absolutely in right. my book, The Loving Push that I did with Deborah Moore, we've mm -hmm. reviewed some of the research also in the brand new edition of The Way I See It. I revamped the video game chapter. And unfortunately, kids on the autism spectrum are more likely to get addicted to video games than just any other kids. And it, they're not having good results because what I'm seeing is there's two paths to the basement, play video games, or we get out and have a life. Yeah. And uh, Elon Musk loved science fiction. He just loved it. So he had to dress up the astronauts as superheroes. I just love it. Jack love on helmets. I <clears throat> looked up, I geeked out on the whole. And then did you see, you did you see the inside of the spaceship? No oh, knobs know. and dials. I know. All computer screen in front of them. Isn't that amazing? Super, super cool. It was super cool. I, but that's like, um, have I, you gone to a launch yet? Yes, Temple? I actually have been to a launch. Um, I did a disability conference um, at Cape Canaveral. I guess it's, they used to call it Cape Kennedy. I guess it's, the original name was Cape Canaveral. I think they're using that now. The other thing is, had to launch from Cape Canaveral, pad 39A. There's only one launch pad in the whole world. This is cool. It's 39A. <laughs> because that's where the moonshot went off from. Right. Had to be pad 39A. You know, he owns launch pads, but they're not cool. Right. Well, there you I, go. I, I, I do it at that. that launch pad, but I went to a SpaceX launch. This is about two and a half years ago. Uh -huh. Very, very cool. I got inside the vehicle assembly building. I completely geeked out on that. Um, but they need us visual thinkers because they were just finishing up a launch pad. I got to go inside it and I found something in that launch pad that shouldn't be there. That's why you need visual thinkers. We what did you find? Seven o'clock in the morning. And you know what I found in the launch pad? I watched no. a raccoon come out of it and waddle down the steps off into the bushes. Stop. And the first thing I thought is, what have you been chewing? And I said, did you see that raccoon? He was, he, he overnighted inside the, the base of your launch pad and there's, with their equipment. What did they say? Well, you better make sure he hasn't chewed stuff. I'll tell you what he'll chew. He'll chew tool handles. Okay, that'd just be annoying because you're going to chew the stuff that you've touched. But if there's some wiring in some box in there and you've left it open that you've touched a lot, he may have chewed that. And you need to inspect that really carefully. See, this is why the mathematical engineers need the visual thinkers. Of course. The they won't see the raccoon, but he could cause a mission to, to screw up. Oh, and for heaven's sake, it was, yeah. Um, it was a total geek fest. Uh, that was... I got very emotional. I stood in front of the vehicle assembly building. I was crying. And I was like crying for happiness during the, uh, you know, I'm so glad Ellen Musk managed to pull that off. That was just the coolest thing. Um, and I was nail biting the whole way, just like I, because, oh, don't have anything go wrong. And then that night I found a cell phone video. Someone had taken to Ellen Musk and he's in the control room at Cape Canaveral and he's glued to the window. Then he bends right. over and he's like doing this to the computer. Probably looking for stage separation. Right. So you, once they're safely in, audit, in orbit, they can relax. But I was nail biting the whole way. Uh, we were too, and we were emotional. And people are writing in saying that they were emotional. Um, it really, it's a new era. But uh, the thing that killed me, were, did you watch on the live feed? Because there were all the things that were happening at the same time, but there was the piece that was going to land on the-, the Oh, that's the, the, that's the first booster. Right, and and then they were like, it's coming, and you could see it coming, and you could see it slowing down, and they had the the shot on the the boat on the drone, and and then all of a sudden it, everything blipped out, and then well, they came I back think you see those there. cameras, I, I, something may have burned up, or you know you don't. Yeah, but it was like David those, Copperfield. He landed those things, and when I went to Cape Canaveral like three, two two and a half years ago, one of those boosters was on the lawn, just dumped on the lawn in front of an airplane hangar. We went by it because they they have to let it cool for three days. And then oh. it's everybody out of the office to clean all the junk off of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, it was it was so exciting and uh, we geeked out on it too, but I the whole time I was like, Temple's gotta be loving this. Temple, well, the Temple's thing that gotta... amazed me is that when that, then they showed them there was, you know, and I've seen those land before that when it was falling, like maybe at this angle, and then right. the computer would start to write the rocket like yeah. this and then it would go down but then it and blipped out for a second and then it was there and i wanted to see it land but we didn't get to see it land. i i don't know now i don't <clears> think <throat> anybody was 
deliberately trying to. Uh, no, I think no, they, I don't think they, they were. They glitched out. You've got an awful lot of stuff going on there. The camera may have fried. Yeah, it might have. That's but it was like a joke. David Copperfield trick. I, um, I love talking no, it's about. it's not something. a trick. They're actually landing. On, and the thing that's so cool is because a 1950s rocket, that's how they land. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's how oh they land. God. But it's the thing was just so, I thought it was so amazing that here it's falling like this. And then the just watch it straight and the computer straightens it. And I hope that people like I'm, you know, my son's encouraged, even though the original launch got scrubbed and then it was on a Saturday, I, you know, my son's school sent out uh, emails to us with the link and said, please watch this with your children. And I hope that everybody gathered their kids around to watch it. That's what happened to me when I was a kid. My dad woke us up in the middle of the night to watch the moon landing. And I was just like six years old. Um, but I, but that's part of what we do to find our kids' passions because see, this gets back to exposing them to stuff. Yeah. I remember as a little kid, uh, we had one of the first TVs in the neighborhood and watching Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Ooh. I didn't really understand why it was important, but it was important. I mean, it was kind of fuzzy, black and white. I remember watching that. And and that had to have made an impression on you I on some. It something to be exposed to. So I hope that, you know, people are watching things like the the launch and the docking and things like that with their kids because that's exposure. Now we did have a couple of questions that came in specifically about workforce. And I know this is a really important uh, topic for you. Somebody says, how do you introduce the workforce to someone who's a runner? He's a, he's an, a loper, a skaper. Do you have any suggestions? Okay, so he, well, they, how how I, how I could use them in the workplace? Well, how you would ex first begin to expose the, the concept of working. Well, first of all, I got to find out, I don't even know how old the kid is. You see, I have to have and, more yeah. information, age, yes. uh, and then start to find out, well, how's he doing in school? What are the good subjects? What are the bad subjects? I'm not going to be do um, a quantum mechanics where you need linear algebra. Okay, I can tell you how to find the paper. You got a little math head. You want to design the next generation of computers? You type in linear algebra, quantum computing. I have found the paper. I have looked at it. I understand <clears throat> it. Linear algebra, quantum computing. Okay. I, there's going to be a kid where you show him that paper. He's going to take off. I'll, I'll use it for scratch paper because I don't understand it. <laughs> you go, well, I don't understand where it. Different minds can do different things. So I need to learn more about him what kind of skills he might have um i uh, you know you take there's a lot of nonverbal people uh, that there's some that i've talked about this before that can type independently and they write beautifully yeah i think people also need to remember too that when people are runners and, and escape there's a reason why and if you work with people to figure That's out what? why they're running and what they're running from or what they're running to then, then you're able to have a much better control. Well, that's right. Then you got to figure out well, when does he do it? You see, what yeah. I've learned on trying to troubleshoot things, that's the engineering term for diagnosis. We're not supposed to diagnose anything, so we're going to be engineers. We're going to troubleshoot stuff. But I find all the time, and I'm right now just wrote another chapter from my new book I'm working on, on, on picture thinking. I don't know how many meetings I get asked by teachers, what do I do about autistic kids in the classroom? Mm -hmm. What do I do with my berserk horse? or my crazy dog. Now, these are real questions I've been asked. There yeah. is no way I can answer that. What did the crazy dog do? Happy jumping on people or biting them? Right. right. Well, then I then the visual mind, I start to think of specific examples of, of a nasty dog or a happy dog. And yeah. I can, I you know, the happy dog is on my lap or it's jumping on me. Yeah. Can and you, come and, fix, can you come and fix what? my dog, Temple? Well, have, first of all, I have to know what they did wrong or what they did. So I, I have, have enough information to yes. answer that question. I, I get it. That's the problem. I, I have a dog that's a rescue that um, she has issues from before. We've been to a behavior. Is with what her. does she she's, do? She's, she's fine with us, but she thinks that she has to defend us from everything and anything else in the world, whether it's a fly or the UPS truck going by a mile away. Um, and she, she's totally fine with us. I could stick my hand in her mouth. She would never bite me, but she, she can't be around other people. 
And now I need for her to be around another dog and we're working very slow to do that. Um, but I've adopted one of Joanne's dogs. That's sweet, the sweetest little puff. He's here in the room with me uh, for the show, but I need for this dog to get along and we're going very slow, but if you know, want to come by. Well, thing I always ask when parents ask me whether their kid's at the right school or whatever, the first question I always ask is, your, is the child making progress? Are you making, making progress, progress with the dog? We are making progress. You're making progress you're and you're doing something progress. right if you're making progress. Okay, all good. I'm sorry I sidelined oh. about my no, dog. No, but the thing right. is, it's the same sort of troubleshooting, um, but you don't know the, the kid can do that math unless you expose them to that book. That's true, that's true. And what all I right. think happened with a lot of the math classes today is the verbal thinkers are you know, on a verbalized math where some of these math heads just need the numbers. They need yeah. the old fashioned books. Yeah. I've only got you for 10 more minutes and I know they're going to just like hate me if I don't start addressing some of these questions, but, uh, and it just jumped and I hate it when it does that. Uh, but Tony had written in, let me see if I can find it, Tony, what you said. Uh, okay. Hi, I am autistic and happy. Hi, Dr. Grant. And as you know, in order to develop skills better, people need to accept criticism and flexibility in your experience. How do you manage it? And he says, take care and stay safe. Cheers, Anthony. Well, I had a boss, so there's that scene in the movie where the boss slammed down the deodorant and said, you stink, use it. That happened. Another time, my first job, I criticized some welding. And I said it looked like pigeon doo-doo. And the engineer- at Did the you place, say doo-doo? Is doo-doo the word you- Harley Winkleman. I'll tell you, he did exactly the right thing. He pulled me into his office in private, mm -hmm. in private, and very quietly told me, that that was not appropriate language. I had to apologize for that. He also, I had apologized to Whitey the welder, which I did, but he also explained to me if I didn't like the welding, Whitey was his employee and I should have gone to him to complain about the welding. So he explained to me sort of the chain of command and then he made me go up to the cafeteria and apologize. Now I didn't tell Whitey his welding was wonderful because it wasn't, but I apologized for the rude language. Harley was the perfect job coach. And he, but he, and he didn't yell and scream at me. He told me very quietly and calmly what I should do in private inside his office. Well, and and but you ex, you accepted it and learned from it. This yes, isn't I easy did learn for everybody. From it. I this did isn't learn easy from it. for everybody. But why do you think that you did? Was it something that you were taught? Because I that... wanted the job. Ah. The same thing with the deodorant. I wanted the job. There were some things where I had to change. And one well, of the things I, that has to change is hygiene. There's that you, ex, yeah. If you want purple hair, fine, but, but you I, cannot be a slob. I'm going to say this because I've learned this from Joanne Lauren. We keep coming back to her, but you know, Joanne has been so passionate from minute one about that all kids deserve the right to to work, and yes, that all I would agree all with that. Kids believe uh, deserve her phrase was they all deserve a seat at the table. But I watched, and, and it, when I first met Joanne, I thought, well, there's probably some people who don't want to work. And, she, and I've watched as she has helped individuals that I thought were too impacted to work. And, and the passion, once they have a job and they understand the parameters, they fight to keep that job. But not everybody has that opportunity, uh, Dr. Grandin. And, and, and like, how do we give them that first work experience so that they see, ooh, when I work, I have, I have a, well, you, you know, accomplish something. Now, the thing is my mind doesn't work and see verbal thinking, you tend to overgeneralize. Okay. You see picture thinking, I think of here's a specific example. Okay, a nonverbal person, I'll tell you, uh, this is a specific example, it's a real person. About two years ago, I went to visit a very, very progressive program. They had a lot of uh, clients that were adults nonverbal. And this client came with binders full of everything bad he'd done, run off, everything terrible about him. And uh, they finally said to him, you want to run? I'm going to mark some uh, ribbons on some trees. This is where you can go run. Mm -hmm. And then they gave him work that was physically kind of demanding, stacking wood. But it's also something where you were stacking wood for a purpose. It wasn't yeah. fake work. You cannot have fake work huh. where you stack the wood and then unstack it. No, it was wood that needed to be stacked. So you were doing useful work and, and they just were, and the guy was there and they threw the binders away. Yeah. They just looked yeah. at it real simply. And the guy went from being the most horrible behavior problems there was to, uh, to do. Now he, he liked the fact that he had a real job, 
The other thing you've got to do if you have a really bad behavior problem is you've got to rule out a hidden painful medical problem. That yes. has to be ruled out. You could have acid reflux, you could have ear infection, you could have toothache. You got to make sure they don't have something like that. I so agree. Uh, one of our regulars on the show, Yadira Calderon, uh, wrote in and she said, Dr. Temple Grandin keeps supporting our teens and adults with autism and creating opportunity for them. Allowing our children to try different things is the best way to relate to them and discover their passion, not imposed based on strengths and interests. That's what I'm trying to do with my Rainbow Mosho. That's her daughter. And she said, so far, so good. Her daughter's well, doing Well, yeah, you've got me. to, you know, uh, when I was in third grade, it was obvious that I was good at drawing, but I just did the same horse head over and over again. Some other said, well, let's draw the saddle. You know, take that interest and broaden it. You want to broaden an interest so it's not so fixated. And um, she introduced other media, watercolors, and, and they're just little kids' paints. Um, but you have a whole book written on on the idea of pushing our kids. Well, another thing that mother did, because my sister loved theater, is that mm -hmm. she she put on plays in the neighborhood in the summer. And she'd get all the kids in the neighborhood to come and they'd put on a play. Yeah. And, and, and what was and, that like for you? What did that do for you? Well, this was something she did more for my sister. I would be in the play. But yeah. she had a lot of the neighborhood kids involved in it. And making Halloween costumes, so making pumpkins. A lot of the stuff that she did, um, it was not expensive stuff. Now the, the plays were mainly done in the summer when it's vacation. But you learned from it, even though it wasn't meant for you, you learned from but it. But I had to learn to cooperate and the, and the whole group had to work together on this. It's not, it was a group activity. There's probably about five or six other kids involved in this. And, but it's, uh, this is an example of something done in the neighborhood and it wasn't that expensive to do it. It took time. Yeah. It took time, and your, mom, it wasn't your, mom expensive. Was, your mom was working, you know, she was doing a lot and had a lot of kids that she had to take care of, but she managed to do that. Well, and then they, they, um, but they, you see, and now you've got people, but now the problem you've got with people at home, they're trying to juggle their job. I was just reading on, uh, in science and nature on the career section. Okay, scientists at home, you know, trying to get their work done. Now they can't yeah. do lab work at home, but they're writing and their statistics and things like that. And one of the things they've learned, a schedule. This is another thing from the space station, a schedule. You got to yeah. get up in the morning. Now there's five astronauts and three exercise machines on that station. So the schedule is going to have to re re rearranged, but everybody has to be at the midday meal. That's a rule yeah. on the space station. Yeah. They don't want them sort of sulking at opposite ends of the station. Yeah. Everybody eats at the midday meal. That's on the official NASA schedule. But they've Isn't learned. It? They've got to put it on a schedule. That's been learned. Yeah. They've had there's been problems on space stations. Well, I mean, and there's a certain amount of stuff that that's rules for respect, mutual respect, yep. and they've learned uh, that they have, they to, have do that. to do a ton of maintenance work on the station. They got to do their scientific experiments. Because 20 years ago on the MER, they had problems. They let it get dirty, stuff broke on it. Part of the station broke, it could have killed them. They had to shut the door on one session and seal it off, uh, real mess. You see, it, then the people working in Antarctica, they've learned the same thing. People working on research ships that are out there, they've got to have a schedule, but they also schedule some alone time where that yes. person can do, where the different astronauts you know, play the guitar. They've collected some instruments over the years play the guitar or read a book or talk to their family. Now, I had promised you that I would let you go at quarter two because I know- you Well, actually I told Mark I was gonna be late. So uh, well, uh, there we, we go. can go a little bit longer. We'll be fine. All right, fabulous. I appreciate that. Okay, so going back to this whole idea of finding your kid's passion. And now we've said, you know, you've got to give them opportunity. You've got to expose them to things. And you can't know until you know. I love our beautiful, um, Spencer Hart, who uh, was not talking and her mother put Phantom of the Opera on just because it was on. And they discovered that Spencer is a beautiful, talented opera singer and has been to China. But you has wouldn't sung at know the White House. unless you exposed. You see, this exactly. is exactly, And you sometimes exactly. don't know. This is what worries me today is kids aren't getting, I mean, the reason I got exposed to the beef industry was when my mother got remarried when I was 14, that brought the ranch into the family. 
Mm. And I, if I had not gone to that ranch, I would not be in the cattle industry. It's that simple. Yeah. That's a perfect example of strictly exposure. So you got to keep throwing darts at the wall and just expose, expose, That's expose. Right. But what are we looking for that tells us, okay, this is the passion? How, like, what, what kinds of things? Well, are we all right, for? let's just look I think at it we really miss simple. It. Let's say you show a math kid the wolf from Mathematica website and he just takes off in it. Okay. Or you dug that old algebra book out of that out of the attic and he actually did it all and you went and showed his work to the high school algebra teacher and he was amazed there we go it could be that but if, simple but a lot of things aren't going to be the thing you might hand the algebra book and and it becomes the doorstop well, so you know, move I, on, i'm not going right? to handle the art kid the algebra book because right. i've talked before about the different minds and that's in my autistic brain book this shows the science that there really is Visual thinkers are object visualizers, object visualizers. These are the art minds. These are also going to be the skilled trades, mechanical, machinery design, people I worked with in construction. Then you have the mathematicians, your computer programmers, the more mathematical parts of engineering. Uh, then you've got word thinkers. Okay, I'm going to be doing a talk with the judges group. They're all word thinkers. So I've got to try yeah. to explain to them what visual thinking is. And well, I'm not going to give... Um, the person who's totally into art, the algebra book. Okay. And and in in the my in the autistic brain book, I talk about um, careers, some of the different kinds of minds. It, it's uh, I mean I use a little bit of discretion, uh, but you also go figure out what what classes is he good at. And a lot of the math kids are being taught baby math. So you have a kid's good at math, <clears throat> let's expose them to programming, scratch oh, yeah. programming for little kids, and then JavaScript. Want to learn how Minecraft works? Here's a book about how to do Minecraft. There you go. And so, and they, and you're going to quickly figure out what he is, or he's maybe going to be a word kid. So he's going to love the Harry Potter books. Yeah. So let's say, for instance, you know, you you sat your kids down and you watched the SpaceX launch, and your kid got like really excited and was was jumping up and down and hand flapping. And you saw that, ooh, they really, really liked that. So then all right, once first of all, I gotta know the age of the kid. So let's say that this, I'm just making this scenario up. Let's say that up. you okay. got a let's let's say that you got a five-year-old. They watched the SpaceX launch and they got very, very excited. What's the next thing that you could do to sort of feed that passion? Well, you could you could play with some water rockets mm -hmm. to get an idea of you know how rocket works. Now five is probably gonna be a little too young for the math. Right. There's math involved just even with a water rocket. Those are things. But even to get like a little. And also, okay. Um, okay, let's 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 use rockets for reading. All right. So you like the SpaceX launch. All right. Let's get a children's book about when we went to the moon. Right. And and we can look things up on the NASA website to, to see that. Well, let's let's use it to teach reading, too. Yeah. Uh, just to read about the, uh, the, the history of, of, of rockets and. You know, they, actually the Chinese invented the first rockets. You know, just read about it. You see, that's taking that interest and broadening it out. I can get reading into it. I can get little, I guess a little older. I can get some more complicated math in it. Those are simple things you could do with that. Because a, kid, feel a five-year-old could be an art kid and love that or be a math kid and love that. Yeah. I Because I feel like a lot of times as, as parents, um, we're trying to get our kids to some mythical place that we don't even know what it looks like. But, but sometimes I think we miss the key that this is the, what the kid is passionate about. Because I hear parents talking about, well, how do I get him to stop perseverating on X? Whatever right, take, X is. take whatever it is and broaden it. Broaden it. Okay, first of all, uh, tell me what it is he perseverates on. Well, for uh, okay, it could be anything, but like parents will write in and say, for instance, my kid is perseverating on Thomas the Tank. All right, Thomas the Tank. All right, that's a common one. All right, let's learn more about different kinds of trains. Right. You got freight trains, passenger trains, you got antique trains. Let's learn about the history of the railroads. Yeah. And how they went up, first went across the United States. Okay, see how I'm taking Thomas and I'm broadening him. Yes. Into a much bigger whole section of trains, a whole great big subject of trains where I can have reading in it. I can do simple math, calculate if a train is going 60 miles an hour, how long would it take to go from you know, Salt Lake City to, to Denver? Yeah. But so just take it and, and, and like, take, that thing, take <clears throat> Thomas and broaden it. 
and broad. Now, if the kid's really young, well, maybe we're gonna just learn about freight trains, you know, freight trains, passenger trains, and maybe old fashioned trains. Yes. And maybe read some other train books, children's train books to start to broaden. But you have an associative link back to Thomas because Thomas is a train after all, yes. he's part of a train. Yes. And so now, now people are writing in about what their kids uh, tend to go towards. Uh, somebody said, my son is nine and he's into jigsaw puzzles. Is he a visual thinker? Jigsaw puzzles may be more of a math thinker. Now I would start, uh, I'd expose them to that Wolfram Mathematica site and I'd start showing them some protein symmetry. Oh, <laughs> It's oh. crazy, it's good. It's, it's protein good. symmetry, it's crazy. It's a magical it's keyword wonderful. when you use it on Google for images. It's amazing. I just looked at it again the other day. I looked all those things up again, make sure they were still sufficiently cool. I would start totally turned me on to that. Um, I uh, maybe simple children's scratch programming, uh, which is yeah. a children's free computer program. It's called Scratch. Let's start showing them that. Okay. That, all right. What's another one? Okay. So another one, they say my son's special interest is Roblox, which is a game different from Minecraft, but he's also interested in Minecraft, Minecraft. And this one is very common for our kids interested in the Titanic. All right, that's fine. Okay, the Minecraft on, um, how old a kid is this? She does not say. Can you write back in, Lynn, and tell us how old your child is? Well, if he's really into Minecraft, I want, if he's a math kid, I'm gonna expose him to Java programming. Okay. Because that's what makes Minecraft work. Now the Titanic, I wanna learn a more, why is he interested in it? Because the first thing I got to do figure is this an art kid, a math kid, or a word kid. And the thing that's been learned now about the object visualizer, which is me, who absolutely cannot do algebra, and the visual spatial, who's the math kid. Lots of people are mediocre at both of these, but nobody's super good at either one. There's a paper mm. called trade-offs. Mm. Super good object visualizer like, like me. Well, programming, I tried, couldn't do it. So I want to learn a little bit more about this kid, uh, what is it about the Titanic that interests him? You know, maybe he might be interested in deep sea diving technology he's to 10. go look at the Titanic. Mom wrote back in and said he's 10 years old, Temple. He's 10 years old. Yeah. Um, well, if he's a math kid, I want to expose him to programming. He's old enough to learn. Let's let's expose him to some real JavaScript. Yeah. And you can get books on that. Another thing, there's a magic word to use in regular Google search. It's called forum. If you just type JavaScript, into Google, it, you don't get much, but if you type in JavaScript forums, whatever thing you're interested in, maybe dinosaur forums, dog forums, I don't care what it is, but you type that magical word forum in a search, it'll pull you up, you know, some cool stuff you won't find otherwise. On the Titanic, I want to kind of, what is it to interest them? Do I take them kind of the engineering route? You know, they're exploring the Titanic wreck. Okay, maybe someone was interested in the love story on, you know, something on the Titanic. Titanic. I want to learn a little bit more about it. If he's an art kid, well, let's do pictures of let's let's do pictures of the Titanic. All right, let's. Uh, if I'm an engineering mind, why did Titanic sink? There's engineering explanations for that. You see, you could go into ex I could explore it from either an art way, you know, more of an engineering way. Um, I, there's a lot of different things I could broaden that that interest. I need to learn a little more about. Uh, his favorite subject in school, because I'm not going to push the physics stuff um, if he's absolutely awful in math. Right. Uh, Crystal says, my son is seven years old, does well in math, but is obsessed with trains and transit. And we see that a lot. That, that uh, Transportation is common. Trains yeah. and airplanes that, well, you see the reason he likes to watch the movement. Well, I just talked about Thomas, the tank engine. You're going right. to do the same things with trains and transit. Yeah, I love the kids who study, they know the whole New York City subway map yeah. and they know, or they know the train schedule for the Boston transit. It's like amazing. Another person says that my daughter is uh, also a jigsaw puzzle whiz, but hates math and is nonverbal. She's, but she's, she's um, nonverbal, but jigsaw puzzles, often pattern thinkers are really good at it, especially if they're good at a jigsaw puzzle that doesn't have a clear picture on, that you're not creating a clear picture. So you don't, you don't like find the blue pieces that be the sky or the green pieces that might be the grass. Um, uh, she hates math, but she's really good at jigsaw puzzles. And, but there's different kinds of math. 
you see, one of the reasons why I want to get you on the Wolfram Mathematica site is that it gets into the real true pattern thinking. Not this, uh, this I think what the way they're doing with the math now, I don't understand what they're doing. The other problem we've got with some of the math now, I was taught to borrow in subtraction. And if I hadn't been allowed to mark the paper, there's no way I could do it. But then you have other kids where they do it in their head, let them do it in the head. They don't think the same way. And um, now we're, we get, we're getting questions about, because we talked about the perseveration thing, um, you know, and you were asking like, what are they perseverating on? And we've got a young man who's 21 who perseverates on mom. He, uh, mom does not have custody of him and he constantly repeats statements saying- And he wants to get back with mom. He says- and He's fully verbal or not? Uh, um, well, he repeats the statements, mom is coming, but in fact, mom is not coming. Well, yeah, he wants her. You see, yeah. that's just plain separation Requesting. anxiety. Yeah. You know, that he, he wants her. Yeah. Um, but it appears from what they've written that mom is not coming, is not able to come. And so um, that's really something for, you know, that's and it's take not some time. impossible even to talk to her yeah. on a video or something. So I don't know what the situation is. I don't know either. You know, and uh -huh. they, they, uh, uh, does he feel better if he has a picture of her? There you go. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's just try to think of a, or yeah. a card from her or something. Yeah, um, my somebody in my family used to have separation anxiety. And so um, a child, I mean, this is a 21 year old, but they, they gave her a hanky from that person and she could put it in her pocket and take it with her everywhere. And it made all the difference. Well, that's sometimes. something simple to do. That's the kind of stuff I like to figure out. Maybe something like that could be done. Okay. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left here and I know we got to get you to lunch. Uh, I don't want Mark mad at me. But yeah, um, I, I, be late, but I told him it's gonna be fifteen minutes late. Okay. But I. Um, but so to wind this up, you know, so important that we expose our kids to as much as possible, and that we watch when they're exposed what excites them, and then, as you were saying, feed that passion by by trying to find as many different ways to pull that. Well, passion yeah, out. transportation is a very common thing that these kids like, but um, and, and some of it is watching the motion. You know, even now, like, I mean, I've been on the thing, I'm in airplanes. I still like to watch airplanes take off. Yeah. I there's, I mean, there's just something really cool about it. One of the things that I've enjoyed about getting to know you, Temple, is, um, you know, I just think passion is the, the funnest thing on the face of the planet. And, and it's so easy to see when you're passionate about something, it's just so easy to see it's recognizable and, um, I love it when you, when we get talking about the things that you geek out on the space things, partially because I geek out on them too, but it's just so fun to see how passionate you are about it. And I wish that as autism parents, we would take that and look at our kids well, in that way. What you got to do is you got to broaden so, yeah. that they, so that the fixation isn't so narrow. Let's learn about some different kinds of trains. Yes. You know, we do math with trains. We can do physics with trains. If you, if the kid's more of a word kid, we can read about the history of the railroad. Yeah, or the but I, I, what I want for the autism community is to start to embrace that. And as you said, broaden it out, but to stop, I think a lot of parents are embarrassed when their 14 year old kid is into a, a toy that is more appropriate for a seven year old. And I think, all right, but let's, but, but let's put, um, um, you know, Thomas is just one of the world of trains. Yes. All right. So let's start learning about Thomas's friends. Right. All the big right. trains. But, uh, but, uh, but let's, let's see that as passion. Them. Just yeah. remember. Let's see that as passion. He dressed the astronauts as superheroes. He did. And when the costume designer was contacted to do it, he thought he was originally doing it for a movie and they designed the spacesuits. Then they had to bring the engineers in to make, to make them it work. actually work. And I you know what I got that. to see during the three and a half hour doc? Right. They had to, they, they didn't show the astronauts putting the spacesuits on and off. They blanked out the video for that. And then when they were sleeping, the thing was just turned off. But when they got the sp spacesuits back on, uh, one of the uh, one of them didn't quite hold the pressure quite right. And they were, the controller was saying, "Now, did you see the white teeth on the zipper or the black teeth?" You see, it was color coded. If it wasn't quite zipped up all the way, you could see this different colored teeth. And they said, "Yeah, we could see mm -hmm. that. You know, oh, wow. wasn't zipped up quite all the way." 
I didn't get to see that. Well, That's that was cool. in the, and they were discussing that. And, and, um, but they had to get the engineers to make them actually work. I love but it. He wanted them to be cool. That goes back to things in childhood. It absolutely does. And so yeah. those, those things that our kids are passionate about, I think we need to embrace them. He wanted them to look cool. And the I regular space suits don't look very cool. I love it. And basically Temple. all those suits are for, for you know, in case the cabin depressurizes. That's exactly. We adore you, Temple. You are such a gift to all of us. I, uh, I hope you have a wonderful lunch. And, uh, you know, we're, I will having, share with uh, we're having barbecue. Nice. I will share with our audience that you and I have talked about having you come back once a month to do this kind of thing on a different topic. And so we look forward to having you on in July and we look forward to everybody being happier, healthier and safer in July. But thank you so much for the time that you have spent with us here today. It's been just delightful. No, no, it was really good. And I just hope I get people to kind of think about things differently. Yes. Yes, and thank you for your wonderful words about Joanne. I will make sure that she gets to, to well, hear those. Well, that's good because, things. boy, she's someone who, she's done a lot of things. we got to just get out and do stuff. Yes, yes, like Joanne. Everybody be like that's Joanne. Right. That's right. All right, uh, Temple, love well, you. Well, I guess so it's time for me to sign off now. Yes. All right, you take care. Thank you so much. I sure will. All right, bye-bye. Right, talk to you. Okay. Thank bye. you. Bye. Uh, bye-bye. Uh, bye. I just want, I want to say, wasn't that... I, I mean, it was just so much fun. And I'm sorry that, you know, um, I do send her the comments afterwards. So if you wrote something in, please know that I do send those to her because a lot of you send in wonderful comments about how much you love her. And it just isn't time during the show to read all of them, but I do send them to her. So I want you guys to know that. Um, also, I want to let you know that tomorrow on the show, we have Evelyn Kung, autism expert Evelyn Kung will be here to answer your questions on Thursday, we're having Yadira Calderon back because she was so amazing last Thursday. We want her to join us again. And on Friday, we are having Matt and Nava Asner from the Ed Asner Family Center join us. Uh, it will be me and Nancy for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy and Matt and Nava talking about things going on at the center. And we'll continue to update you about uh, my dear friend, Joanne Laura. Please everyone stay safe. I will see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.